Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Aaron, and this is my colleague, Ko. And we're here to talk about scaling a GitOps platform at Adobe. So uh, first, I want to give a little bit of background on us, what we work on, our journey so far, how we dealt with the rapid adoption of our platform. And we want to leave you with some lessons and recommendations so that you don't make the same mistakes we did. Uh, and we'll try to leave so, some time at the end for Q&A. Okay. So I'm Aaron, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm an architect on developer platforms at Adobe. My GitHub is JSVK. Uh, and developer platforms is an org at Adobe that provides internal tooling for our developers. Uh, I've been at Adobe for about four years. Uh, and I work on helping design and build out this platform. And I'm, hi, I'm Ko. I've been with Adobe for almost 12 years now. Uh, I worked at a bunch of startups before this, and I've been a DevOps engineer, uh, before it was called that, uh, for well over 20 years. And I focus more on the infrastructure and deployment side of things uh, and help run our CIC platform. Cool, so what do we do? So Flex is our GitOps platform, on top of which we've implemented a CI CD solution that we've rolled out to Adobe. Some of us in the room may recognize Flex from past Adobe projects. This is a different Flex, completely unrelated to that. Uh, it's built on our po and popular open source products you might have heard of, uh, many of which are CNCF. So uh, for example, Argo CD, Kubernetes, Backstage, and so on. Uh, and worth noting, it's GitOps based from top to bottom. Uh, to give an idea of the scale we're dealing with, we sync to over 300 Kubernetes clusters and counting. Uh, our largest Argo CD instance syncs over 12,000 applications, and it's responsible for syncing over 600,000 Kubernetes resources. And at the time of writing, this was roughly accurate, but it's probably much more now. So uh, let's zoom in on what makes up Flex. So Flex provides a paved path to help users get from an empty GitHub repo to a solution running in production. And by paved path, I mean specifically, we provide developers with shared, standardized, secured templates and these templates include advanced deployment strategies like Canary and Blue Green, uh, as well as a standardized set of build and deploy pipelines. Uh, we try to keep them open to customization and extension, and we also, we also provide GitOps-based tooling to help users provision infrastructure across various Adobe services. So for example, uh, artifactory repos for Helm and Docker, uh, the build and deploy infrastructure itself, vault policies, and so on. So here is a rough overview of some of the notable points in our journey rolling out Flex. Uh, we chose Argo CD applications to represent our, go our growth. Uh, it's not a perfect metric, but it's a good enough heuristic. Uh, so we started with, like a, with a lighthouse phase. Uh, and then shortly after our go live date, uh, we saw a rapid uptick in client adoption. Uh, this resulted in our fair share of production outages, uh, to, to which we responded by forming a stability tiger team. Uh, to address the stability and scalability, scalability issues. Uh, we, con we considered these to be roughly the phases of our evolution around that time. Uh, and this vertical scaling improvements phase worked great until we, of course, hit the limits of our vertical scaling. For this, we needed to re-architecture our, uh, we, we needed to re-architecture the platform, which we'll get to in a few slides. Uh, and now we're here. Um, we're doing great now. But obviously, the journey here has been rough. Uh, and now I'm going to hand it over to Ko to go into more detail about how we responded to this growth. Uh, thanks, Aaron. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, we needed to quickly address uh, our stability and scalability issues. Uh, so we start out by first uh, uh, tuning and scaling our existing infrastructure. So in our environment, we are running Argo CD and workflows. Uh, so most of our example solutions here will be more specific to them, but the general concepts uh, should still apply to other GitOps engines. Uh, one major issue that we had was that our GitOps engine was under really heavy load and we needed to scale up within our existing uh, cluster. So our solutions here were to scale up replica accounts for various components, uh, such as Argo CD application controller and the repo server. Uh, this is a quick and easy way to gain additional performance uh, from your engine to start. Uh, when increasing the replica counts uh, for the application controller, um, just keep in mind uh, that it will depend on the size and number of remote clusters that you'll be managing, uh, as well as the total number of resources that you are managing on each of them. 
We also tuned uh, processing settings, such as the status and operation processors, uh, in increased QPS and burst settings for the Kubernetes API uh, client-side rate uh, limit. This helped uh, speed up the app syncing and reconciliation times. We also set uh, pod anti-affinity rules to reduce any noisy neighbor issues for Argo CD specifically. Uh, this is important for the application controller uh, when it's under really heavy load, as well as uh, if your cluster is shared with uh, tenant workloads, as those workloads can sometimes be really unpredictable. So try to spread out your workload to multiple worker nodes uh, as much as possible. Another problem that we ran into uh, is that our GitOps engine was performing really poorly uh, due to some unnecessary work that was being performed by it. So we tackled this by reducing the number of Kubernetes resources that it was managing by specifying resource inclusions and exclusions. The important point here is to exclude things that you really don't want your engine to manage. Uh, for example, uh, CLI resources like uh, associated with Cilium or endpoints. Argo CD also keeps all resources that is managing in memory, so it's really best to exclude anything that you don't need. On Argo workflows, we also did something similar by excluding node events. Uh, that was not needed in our environment. Another problem that we ran into was that the number of times that the GitOps engine was performing uh, self-healing actions. This was partly due to some misconfigured problematic applications, which I'll cover a little bit more in the later slide. Uh, our, so our GitOps engine was performing extremely frequent self-healing and spending uh, reconciliation cycles on unnecessary resources. As an example, if you have self-healing turned on in Argo CD, the default timeout here is five seconds. We've tuned that up all the way to 10 minutes, uh, as I've shown here. Uh, and we also disabled the health status persistence, uh, which reduces the number of application CRD updates and the data volume on the Kubernetes backing store, uh, which is etcd. It also improves application controller performance. We also experienced slowness in our GitOps engine, uh, as well as uh, uh, slowness in our cluster performance. And for that, we actually tackled that by tuning parallelism and compression settings. So for example, for the Argo CD repo server, it actually helped to reduce the parallelism there and to, uh, to scale up the processing with additional replicas instead of additional parallelism uh, settings. Uh, and too high a setting there actually slowed down the processing for the repo server. And we also limited the parallelism settings in the Argo workflows as tenants were able to spin up an extremely large number of pods and workflows in parallel without setting those. We also enabled compression settings that helped help with the Argo CD UI performance as well as help reduce Redis database sizes. At the same time as limiting some settings like parallelism, there were various limits that we actually needed to increase in order to gain more performance from our system. We were hitting uh, various timeouts on our system we were, and we were getting frequent restarts and pot evictions of some of our components. So the solution to the restarts were to set proper resource requests. If you are using Argo CD and workflows, for example, like out of the box, they are really, they're just not set at all. So you would just want to make sure that they're set appropriately, uh, set for all components and increase them as required for your environment. Another example, if you're running lots of services like we are, is that you may need to increase your gRPC payload max size. Without the setting, you might have uh, trouble uh, getting back results from the Argo CD uh, uh, server uh, if the application count is too high. Uh, another thing that we did was to fix replication settings. Uh, for example, Argo CD uses Redis as the caching engine, and some of the settings there need to be tuned in order to ensure that the Redis replication work properly with the larger database sizes. The screenshot here shows uh, the settings that we tune. Uh, so we increase the client output buffer limit and the min replicas array. Another thing that we did was that we set uh, set or increase timeouts uh, as required. So for example, uh, what we did was for a repo server, we set uh, timeouts there and increased uh, reconciliation timeouts um, if you happen to be hitting those. We also had some problematic workloads running on our system, uh, which was causing disproportionate workload on our system, which we needed to address. So you'll want to make sure to fix or remove any kind of problematic resources they have. For example, um, uh, uh, flapping applications. Uh, they're especially really bad as they cause significant load on the application controller and can starve resources for your other healthy apps. Uh, and the flapping app, in case you're not familiar with them, is an application that is, for example, a flipping state back and forth really, really rapidly. For example, if it's uh, going in and out of sync, in and out of sync, 
really rapidly within seconds. So how do we detect those? In Argo CD, uh, the simplest way is to watch the UI for go apps going in and out of sync uh, frequently. For example, with the de default self-heal settings, you'll see apps going in and out of sync every five seconds or so. You can also look at your logs. Uh, for example, if you see the application status changing several times a minute, you probably have a flapping app. And an example of a flapping app manifest, uh, diff, is shown here. Uh, here, uh, there's another process adding in debug lines uh, shown on the left in red. Uh, and then on the right, the application, uh, Argo CD application sync is, is trying to remove them. And it keeps fl flipping back and forth, and it just goes in and out of sync. And uh, another thing that you want to watch out for uh, is that uh, to make sure that you're cleaning up any unused or test applications. It's, it's a little bit self-explanatory, but uh, it's important to just note uh, because they tend to be the applications that your developers are probably ignoring. They set up once and forgot about it, right? Um, in addition, uh, uh, you want to watch out for any kind of large Git repos uh, that you, you are managing with your GitOps engine. Uh, they might require special tuning. Uh, for Argo CD, specifically, you want to watch out for mono repos, which Argo CD defines as uh, any, any one Git repo that manages over 50 Argo CD applications. Another problem that we had with that was that our SD database, which again is the backing store for Kubernetes, uh, that was growing very, very rapidly, and we needed a way to reduce the database size and keep, to keep it in check. So here, the database uh, size is really actually very important because it's recommended to stay under the eight gig limit. And to do this, the best way that we found was to archive any kind of old data when at all possible. So we're running Argo workflows, and specifically for that, uh, there's a feature that you can turn on called archive workflows. And that helps reduce the number of pods and workflow events that are stored in SCD. You'll also want to increase the frequency of any cleanup processes. Uh, and the, another example for workflows is to reduce the active deadline seconds and TTL strategy to delete completed workflows after a set time. And another, yet, exa yet another example is to enable PodGC, and that setting will delete any completed pods. So now I'll cover some additional general tips. Uh, so first, uh, make sure you use an informer cache uh, where possible. Uh, in our case, uh, we switched from using the Kubernetes APIs to Argo CD APIs as it gave us an informer cache for free and we didn't need to maintain our own. This was actually a resolution to one of our big, big production outages that we had. Um, and then ensure your Kubernetes cluster is, is healthy uh, and tuned correctly. Uh, and this, this by itself can be a whole talk by itself, so I'll, I'm just gonna touch on some of the basics here. Uh, so make sure you're monitoring your API server and etcd performance. Make sure you're monitoring your etcd database size. That's a big problem that we had. Uh, monitor the APF queue uh, and ensure things aren't falling into that queue. Uh, perform any kind of CNI tuning as required and ensure that you have enough IP space for your cluster as well as for all of your pods. And now I'll hand back to Aaron to talk about some additional scaling efforts that we took. Cool, thank you. So vertically, scaling has gone a long way in terms of helping our stability and scalability. Uh, for example, we went from struggling with 2,000 Argo CD applications to comfortably handling 12,000. But like any vertical scaling, we're bound by physical limitations, like the maximum size of the SD database or the resources available on a single node to allocate to the pod and so on. To address that, we needed to come up with a horizontal scaling strategy. The problem is, at the time of design, our platform was already in active use. So we needed to be conscious of our impact uh, to any production workloads. So that meant zero downtime cutover to any new architecture. Uh, and we also needed an architecture that was easy to understand, communicate, and implement, you know, so that we could reach quick alignment and begin work immediately. We also had a tight deadline, of course. Who doesn't? Uh, and an analogy I liked is it's comparable to refueling mid-flight. So uh, here's a simplified version of the Flex architecture from our previous slide. Uh, and this is what we needed to horizontally scale. So the first step was to determine what makes up an installation of Flex. Uh, for us, this was just the entire Kubernetes cluster and all the Flex-related components running in, running in it. So we plan, the plan was to horizontally scale Flex by scaling the number of clusters. Um, we called each one of these clusters running Flex components Flex boxes. 
uh, and we built uh, tooling to automate the creation of additional flex boxes like this. Uh, we then used it to create an additional installation of Flex uh, in this example, uh, labeled Flexbox 2 here, which again is just an additional Flex cluster. The next problem is on its own it doesn't really do anything yet. Uh, so in order to actually make use of it, uh, we added a component for routing traffic from GitHub in order to load balance across the different flex boxes. Uh, so this would act like a, a load balancer to use a traditional networking analogy. Uh, and in the diagram, you can think of the GitHub events as our incoming traffic. Uh, and the redirection component here is the, is the load balancer. Uh, so the next problem is this does help stop things from getting worse. But we still had the issue of the overloaded Flexbox 1 from before this, right? So from that, for that, we built tooling to redistribute existing load from Flexbox 1 onto Flexbox 2. And this tooling would essentially uh, seamlessly move client workloads between Flexboxes without downtime to their services. Uh, and while most of this seems like a relatively drastic re-architecture, we were able to do this with minimal client impact. Clients would continue to use a single endpoint for accessing their Argo CD or Argo workflows instance associated with their uh, respective Flexbox. And this has been working great for us so far. So now, I'll talk about lessons we learned from our experience and some recommendations. So first, plan for horizontal scaling in multiple instances. This will simplify things in the long run. Uh, if horizontal scaling is planned for upfront, you can defer some of the vertical scaling. Uh, the trade-off is some increased infrastructure costs, but this, but this can save developer time and build up some operational experience. Uh, and it's worth mentioning, even if you don't think you'll need it, do it anyway. Uh, plan a sharding strategy. For example, sharding by some function, like class of workload or business unit, can help you distribute load evenly. Uh, make sure you can create additional instances to be used for horizontal scaling. Uh, we didn't do this up front, and we wish we had. For us, additional instances came in the form of what we call flexboxes. This will vary from platform to platform. Design what works best for your platform. Plan for redistributing your workloads. Sharding is hard to get right the first time, and so our relocation tooling has been invaluable to us. And another thing to consider is to divide any intensive workloads that you might have into separate clusters. If they rely on the same control plane and bottlenecks, they'll affect each other's performance. As an example, if you're running both Argo CD and Workflows like we are, try to run them on different Kubernetes clusters if at all possible. Ar so Argo CD consists of long-lived workloads and also generates a large number of events, and it wor really works best when it's on its own cluster. And if you're running lots of workloads, uh, workflows like we are, Argo Workflows can cause lots of etcd churn, as workflows consist of many CRDs as well as many pods spinning up and down, and usually consists of many short-lived workflows. This type of workload is the exact opposite of Argo CD, so it's really best to keep them separate, if at all possible. And we unfortunately did not uh, split them, and it actually forced us to do additional tuning for both CD and workflows. And due to the volume of workflows that we were running, we were hitting database limits for etcd, which is why I kept talking about it, uh, and uh, this limited the number of Argo CD applications that we can support on a single cluster. When to start tuning for scale? So we started uh, seeing issues with a couple hundred tenant services running. And depending on your architecture or platform, you might start to see slowdowns even earlier, so it's really never too early to start tuning. Also, the exact number of obviously depend on your GitOps engine platform, of course. And in Argo CD in particular, the number of Argo CD applications to watch for are about 1,500 to 2,000 or so Argo CD applications. And also, each Argo CD application can only target one remote cluster, so you might hit this number fast, way faster than anything. And this also applies even if you use application sets. And if, again, if you're struggling to scale your GitOps solution, you should definitely follow some of the tips that we gave in this talk. In addition, understand your bottlenecks and make sure they're properly monitored. Understand the knobs that you can turn in your system. And finally, we've also done some other talks on this topic, uh, so be sure to check them out. And I've linked one of those here uh, in the QR code here. And uh, that concludes our talk. Thank you everyone for listening. And we'll open up for Q&A now. All right, who has questions?
server. And when we did, we started to experience timeouts uh, during our scaling events that were just running probably over provision static uh, replica accounts. Is there any way we can get to auto scaling without that effect? So actually, that's a great question. And that's actually something we've hit as well. I mean, we, we're also running a static number of repo servers. Uh, we found that um, you know, keeping them smaller, li limiting the parallelism actually was really important. So I, I touched that here and I, I covered the exact setting. So definitely check that out. Um, I'd highly recommend limiting the parallelism and just scaling up the uh, repo server count. Uh, we actually didn't auto scale either. Uh, we, we kept it at a static count. Uh, and in our, in our case, uh, we're, not, we're adding a lot of backpatients, but we're not deleting that many all that frequently. So we found that just you know, manually managing them has helped a lot. Um, in terms of uh, uh, actually like doing a dynamic auto-scaling on repo server, I think you know, depending on you know, how you have it tuned, it might not work as well because uh, you know, the, the repo server tends to you know, maintain like state, right? So by trying to you know, scale down too much, uh, you, you might end up you know, having negative impact and you know, having like, issues with your reconciliation and uh, um, you know, having issues with uh, uh, reconciling with your with your Git uh, with your Git server and things like that. So um, we personally have it set to a static number, and we just you know, uh, you know gradually you know monitor it and gradually increase it as needed. So um, I guess that that's been working for your environment so far, right? So I mean, I think that that's that's what I would uh, recommend sticking to if if possible, um, unless there's like a cost consideration. So yes. Uh, so we we actually ex we do use the UI pretty heavily. We expose it to clients, so they actually look at it. Um, it is not a huge impact because, if I remember correctly, the the state for the UI is managed separately from the state of the actual resource tree. Uh, so it's been pretty okay for us um, when it comes to like uh, performance bottlenecks for that. Like sometimes, yeah, we'll see the. UI kind of is a bit slow to update, but uh, as far as I remember, it, it doesn't really impact the, the performance of the actual uh, controllers. And, and yeah, to add to, add to that, um, yeah, uh, depending on how many applications you're running, as like an admin, for example, you might see UI slowness issues, but our clients that have a, a more limited set of uh, our CD applications that they're seeing, they won't see that issue as much uh, because we're you know with we're limiting that with RBAC, right? Uh, and yeah, again, as Aaron said, uh, the, the, I think the controller is separate from the the UI part of things. So even if the UI appears slow, that doesn't mean that you're you know the the reconciliation and you know that stuff is still not happening, right? So yes. Uh, got it. So uh, the question is like a, about a general way to find your performance bottlenecks. Yeah. So I would say um, obviously start off by just uh, doing a breakdown of what your bottlenecks are and making sure they're all monitored. And obviously that's not always going to catch everything right away. Um, for the instances where there's a bottleneck that you didn't uh, notice, you are just going to have to you know, go through the standard troubleshooting process. Uh, and when you reach something that you can horizontally scale, like let's say you're running into uh, repo server timeouts, um, you probably want to, from there, just try horizontally scaling it or vertically scaling it. Um, and then when you are not in like an emergency situation where it's like affecting your actual production environment, you can work on like uh, benchmarking, figuring out where, where the bottleneck there is, like what causes it. Uh, yeah, it's a yeah. It's like a it's a general uh, troubleshooting process that you get better with over time with practice. 
And yeah, just to step back, uh, you know, obviously make sure all of your components are monitored, right? So for, for example, Argo CD, uh, th there are some open source uh, 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 Grafana um, uh, dashboards and things like that that you can download and you know start. Uh, you know, th that's a great starting point. Uh, that's what we started with. Uh, make sure your uh, Kubernetes, uh, you know, the cluster itself is monitored. Uh, just make sure the API support server performance is, is doing okay. Like, you know, check the latency and things like that. If you're seeing like huge latency spikes or like 60 second timeouts in your requests and th things like that, I mean, that's where you'd, you'd want to start looking. So yeah, that's actually a good call. You get a bunch of Prometheus metrics for free from Argo CD and uh, Etsy. So those are great lists to start. One metric, that's a, I'd say the Kubernetes server late, uh, API server latency, like the requests, right? Yeah. That's a big one because we were, we were definitely hitting the, like those 60 second timeouts and things like that. Yeah, um, yeah just watch for those. And, and you can see some of those in, on, the, on the client side of the, as well, right? Or, or on the Argo CD side. Uh, just watch your server logs, you know, uh, control logs, repo server logs, things like that um, as well. Yeah, uh, that's, that's like the general story for a lot of um, Kubernetes native products is like they, they pretty heavily utilize the, the API server. So that's probably going to be like the number one place you need to keep your monitoring. 